Here we go now. You know, we look forward to this opening day. He did it last year for us on MLB Network. He's uh, baseball's commissioner on his 28th day of March. We got games all over the place. It's an exciting day in sports, and he says hello. Rob, nice to talk. How are you today, pal? Okay? I'm great, Chris. How are you? Okay. I know you're a big Mickey Mantle fan, so right. give me your recollections. I don't know if it was at Yankee Stadium, but give me the Rob Manford in upstate New York recollections on your first big memory of an opening day. Go ahead. You know what? They always tell me I can answer the question the way I want. So I, I, I'm not going to talk about one when I was a kid. Uh, the one I'd like to talk about was the first one I went to live, which was um, at uh, Shea Stadium. Uh, it was in 1988, I believe. Um, and I'd never been to an opening day live. And, you know, I always loved opening day, but the idea of seeing it, being in a ballpark, I was invited to go to, you know, a party before the game that the Wilpons and the Double Days threw. And it really was a memorable opening day for me. I think it was the first time I really grasped the whole experience of opening day. How about that? Remember, Rob is a huge Mantle fan, so he got into the Yankees a long time ago. His father used to take him to the games the whole nine yards. All right, before we get to the big issues, let's do some of the big, the big uh, things you're doing this year with the sport. You got the series in London, and you got the Birmingham scenario, Giants and Cardinals at Rickwood. That is a tremendous idea. You hit a home run with uh, Iowa. You probably hit another home run here. That's an excellent thought there. Give me some uh, conversation there. Go ahead. Let me hear. Well, we're excited about the international group you know we've already been to the Dominican Korea uh, obviously we're going to Mexico um, and you know excited to get back to London with another good matchup um, I do think Rickwood is going to be a highlight of the year for us um, I, I think there's a great theme surrounding it um, I love the idea of taking our game to places we have not been where we don't play regularly and I particularly like it when there's some historic significance to it. And, and Rickwood, that's certainly the case. I also think it's a great opportunity for us to celebrate, you know, one of the greatest players in the game. You already said it. I was a Mantle guy. But hard to argue about how great Willie Mays was. Do you think Mays, if he's healthy, he'll show up at that, won't he, Rob? I would think no. I, I hope so. I hope that his health will allow it. Yeah, the plan is yes. And, you know, I hope that he's healthy enough to do it. And that game will be on Fox. Let's make sure we know people tell people that in late June, correct? That's correct. That's correct. All right, that's important. All right, let's uh, – we haven't heard you about Otani here. Let's get a general statement for you first. I know you're doing an investigation. We haven't heard the commissioner on this. At least I haven't. Give me a statement on Otani here and how baseball is doing this. Go ahead. Let me hear. Look, I, I, you know, I, the way we're thinking about this is um, given the way the story unfolded, it's important in terms of um, assuring our fans – uh, about the integrity of the game, that we verify um, the things that Mr. Otani has said. And it, it's really that simple. Uh, do you have to work with the federal investigation with this? Are they, do they, are they cooperative as far as helping you with information, or does your investigative team have to do all this by yourselves? How about that? Let me hear. Yeah. When it, it's really difficult um, for the uh, federal authorities to cooperate with us fully when they have their own ongoing investigation. Um, so I think this is one where we'll have to proceed on our own. All right. Are you, can you make people talk to you? Can you get a hold of this translator? Can you get a hold of the spokesman? Is Otani, does he have to talk to you? Do they, uh, do, do you expect him to talk to you? Thoughts there. That can be a tricky one. Let me hear there. Go ahead. Look, we, we, we never have the kind of authority that law enforcement people have, but we managed to get these investigations done and find the facts, and I'm sure we will on this one. And this is going to take a long time? You expect this months or short? What do you have there? I, I hope short. Hope I, short. I hope short, but I just don't know. You don't know. All right, that's the, let, let's do that. All right, the owners of the Orioles, new owner there. I guess there was no stipulation with that Masson thing with the, with the Nationals, but a new owner in Baltimore, I know that was approved yesterday. Give me some thoughts on that. Go ahead. Let me hear. Well, I think, I think we're, you know, look, the Angelos family, um, you know, owned the team for three decades. Um, you know, Peter uh, worked with me on three labor agreements. Um, uh, and, you know, they, they were good stewards in Baltimore. But uh, I think people are really excited uh, about David Re Rubenstein taking the, the, the team over. Um, he's got great Baltimore roots. He's a huge baseball fan. And I think it's going to be really good for the franchise. And this happens right now. He is officially the owner today. Or is there a little four or five month window where he kind of isn't with the transition of power? What's up with that? No, he. 
he's the control person effective yesterday when the club voted they, they actually closed the transaction yesterday and david rubenstein's in charge today all right, and the Masson thing, I know there's, I know what the Astros, when they came into the league a few years ago, you made them switch leagues, which the right idea. Was there any stipulation with him getting the, the Oriole ownership? Any stipulation there or no? No, there was no requirement there. I do think with the change in ownership, it's, it, it, it's an opportunity, coupled with the fact that the litigation has really progressed. I think it's an opportunity for the two clubs to work it out and put it behind us. All right, speaking of television, RSN. Where do we stand with this? I know it was a major factor with certain teams. You guys do a great job of getting the games on, but there is loss of money. Give me a little, give the fans a little rundown. I'm a little confused myself. Give me a little rundown on that. Go ahead. Yeah, yeah look, I think the most important thing is, is the point you made. Um, no matter what happens, we are in a position that fans will not be deprived of baseball. They'll be able to watch the games um, in the cable bundle where they've traditionally been able to do it. And, you know, to the extent that we take over other teams, we will have a digital product available in market. So uh, it, from a fan's perspective, they're, they're going to either have the same or more access um, in, in terms of watching games. In terms of the economics, you know, local media is about 25 percent of our revenue. Um, there's absolutely no question that that particular revenue stream is, is, is challenged right now. Um, but we see it as a trough. Um, you, you know, there's going to be a little downtick here, but we believe over the long haul, the value of the content will out. And, you know, clubs will be back to and beyond where they have been historically. Uh, how many teams are affected from an economic standpoint this winter? Was it 10, 50? I know it's got like a 16 no. team thing. How many Texas, Seattle, Cleveland? How many teams overall, Rob? Well, it, 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 the way I look at it is that everybody is to some extent affected by the changes that are going in the cable bundle. The people who have act or the clubs that have actually seen revenue declines would be Seattle, Colorado, um, San Diego, Arizona, and then small declines um, in Texas, Minnesota, and Cleveland. All right, so there are certain teams, so we keep that in mind. Uh, a lot of people, the Dodgers were really the only team that went crazy spending money this offseason. A lot of people, you know, on their side with the five free agents who didn't get the Chapmans and the Montgomerys who just signed, didn't get the sort of sort of offers or upgrade financially that maybe a lot of people thought they might. To me, it's a market scenario. Some years it's good. Some years it may not be so good. But, you know, on the union side, they're going to say, wow, a lot of teams are not trying to win, not spending money. Let me hear your thoughts with that. Go ahead. You know, you, know, you just walked into one of my pet peeves. You, you know, I don't think about the game in terms of our side, their side. It's one game. Um, we ought to all be working together to make the game as good as we possibly can. Um, in terms of the market, um, I think you put your finger on it. Um, we have a market-based system. Um, and when you have issues like the RSN issue that you just alluded to that affect a significant number of teams and, and all the teams see problems uh, on that horizon, it's going to affect the market for players. It has to. All right, so you, to you, did you get that message across when you hear folks, Boris, say, you know what, uh, teams are not trying to win, the market's lousy, we need to, does that bother you? Do you sort of get your point across to the other side to make sure that this is really a market scenario and this will be corrected down the road? Do you feel like you have to make that point across? Make that Look, point. I've, been, I've been meeting with the players directly um for you know each team the last two years and i've started already this year um i think the players understand that they bargained for for a market system and that markets are going to vary uh year to year um i i think the bigger issue in terms of talking with players is making sure they understand what's going on with respect to local media so they can appreciate the impact that it has on the market uh did it bother you at all that the dodgers you know spent a billion dollars on two players and a lot of other teams maybe not went that crazy from a have have not thing did that concern you in the offseason rob yeah, we, look, we always worry about the perception of fans that, um, you know, that there's massive economic differences between teams. I think the important thing to bear in mind is that um, spending doesn't guarantee winning. You know, a year ago we were talking about how much the Mets had spent. 
And, you know, I, my recollection is on October, it was not the Mets that were there in the World Series. So, um, you know, I think the great thing about our game is you can win a bun bunch of different ways. And while we worry about disparity, I think it's important to bear in mind that disparity is not determinative in terms of who actually wins. I totally agree. And remember, it wasn't just the Mets. San Diego didn't win either, and they spent a fortune, too. So let's not forget that. Let's do a couple stadiums. Tampa, are we, all systems go with St. Pete for that new ballpark with the race what, what's up with that yeah i think the race continue to make steady progress on the effort to get the stadium built in in st pete there's a couple of votes that have to take place still um you know we saw the race people down in the dominican uh, when the team was down there and um uh we're hoping that uh that continues um the stadium gets built in the tampa bay region but you're confident you're confident long term future for the Rays in St. Pete. You're confident at the moment? I am. I am. You know, they have a plan. There seems to be good public support. I've met with the politicians myself and uh, you know, it's not over till it's over, but um we're hopeful that it's gonna get done. All right. Now listen, you know, the Super Bowl was there and I was there, so you know me. I like to ask my little questions and do my little thing. You've been part of that for a long time. And I got the idea that the Vegas, whether it's the site whether it's not an expansion team, they're wrapped up with the football and the hockey, that maybe Vegas lost a little juice with the A's. Are you still confident at the end of the day the Oakland's going there? And are you still confident at the end of the day Vegas will be a good Major League Baseball town? What's your, what's your thoughts with that? Yeah, I'm 100% confident on both of those issues. Um, the A's are going to Las Vegas. I, I, I've seen the site myself. I was out there this fall. I think the site's going to be great. It's right on the strip. Um, I, I think the design of the stadium and the, the release of the renderings um, has generated um, a lot of enthusiasm and excitement in Las Vegas. You know, I think that the only drawback, look, it, you know, I'm coming in three years. You know, it's a long road to get the stadium ready and get the team there. And I think what you're going to see over time is the excitement in Las Vegas is going to build and it's going to be a great baseball town. You're not bothered by the mayor. She had some things to say. What's your thoughts with that? Yeah, you know, look, I, I think that, you know, she said some things and, you know, she then said some different things. Um, I, I think one of the issues there is the uh, stadium site where you're going to be, city of Las Vegas, Clark County, a bit of an issue. The only thing I can tell you about the mayor is the very first person from Las Vegas that approached me about baseball was the mayor. Wow, good one. Well done there. All right, where, is the a where are the A's going to play in this transition? Have the team, have you made, for next year, I know this year in Alameda, but uh, down the road, have the, have the sport figured out where they might play in the transition period, those two years or so? Where could they play? Yeah, I I think we're close to an announcement on that. I, I, I'm not in a position to tell you exactly what the answer is, but they've made great progress on that issue, and it'll be resolved in time for us to do the schedule for 2025, right. which is really All right, good. Answer. Thank you. That's a good little nugget there. Quickly there. You made the announcement in spring training, uh, and I was interesting that you did it, and you got a lot of work to do, and it's a long way off. Your retirement announcement. Give me your thoughts on making that decision and making sure everybody knew about that. I think you did that the first trip you made in spring training. I'm curious there. Go ahead. Let me hear. You know, Chris, I got to be honest with you. I, I didn't intend to make news that day. Um, I was very candid at the time I was reelected, both with the owners and, and, and publicly, that um, I wanted to be reelected. I wanted five more years, but that that, that I felt that, uh, you know, it'll be 14 years, maybe 15 um, at, at that point, I'll be 70 years old. I think it, um, it is healthy for an organization to know that the run's going to be over at that point in time, um, that, you know, somebody else's vision should, should drive the sport. It puts the owners in a position that they can plan um, from a succession perspective. And, um, you know, as I said, I thought people understood it and didn't intend to make dues that day. I really didn't. Uh, you know, it's funny. Everybody that I talked to, and I had nine managers on on radio, and I asked every single one of them, and boy, oh, boy, I know that a lot of the folks on the other side don't want to give you the credit. you got to feel pretty proud with the rules. That's a home run. I mean, the speed of the game, the bases, and everything else. Uh, I know when you hit the pillow every night or when you're, you know, knocking in that 15-foot putt to win a little Nassau, you say, you know what? I did something right with the rules. Makes you feel yeah. good. Let me hear your thoughts there. Go ahead. Look, I, you know, the rules were really a success. I think that the, the key to it is we listen to our fans. 
Uh, we took our time. Uh, we developed a set of rules that we felt we understood what was going to happen on the field. And we delivered to the to our fans the best form of baseball, the form of baseball uh, that they wanted. Um, and, you know, it showed up in our business. You know, we got back about 70 million people for the first time last year. It was a 10 percent increase, um, the biggest attendance increase in years. And, um, you know, frankly, we're, we're hoping we're going to see the, uh, an increase on top of that this year. And that's the most important issue. And Bud Black told me yesterday that he thinks his automated strike zone, at least a challenge system where a batter can challenge or a pitcher can challenge a couple of times a game on balls and strikes, he thought that was forthcoming and coming quicker than we thought. Is that true? Look, I do think we're going to use the ABS in the big leagues at some point. We used it pr pretty successfully in the minor leagues in two forms, the challenge system that you refer to, as well as the system where, you know, the umpire has an earpiece and gets every single call from the system. Um, I, you know, look, we, I, we owe it to our fans to do everything we can to make sure we get the calls on the field right. Um, what I like about the challenge system is it gets back kind of to the original concept of instant replay. Um, that is, let's give uh, ourselves the opportunity to correct a mistake, particularly in high leverage situations, ones that really matter. You may not need it on every single pitch, but there are big pitches in ball games where mistakes can get made, where a challenge system would clean that up. Uh, it would. Now, you mentioned on radio with me, and I'll let you go here in a minute. I appreciate so much time. You mentioned on radio there at the World Series that you didn't think it was fair last year that the Braves beat the Phillies by a million games, and then right away they had to go beat them again in a best of five. And you hinted that maybe down the road you'd have to think about changing that, so a reseed thing and everything else. Did you give that some thought over the winter? Where do you stand with that right now? Go ahead. We did. We did. I think it's a topic that's going to be ongoing. I, I, I think the conversation over the winter was, um, you know, we try not to be too reactive. If anything, I think people ha have said that, you know, my administration that we're too inclined to make changes. I think on that one, um, the conclusion we reached over the winter was we just a lot wanted to see how the system operated uh, a little longer before we jumped into making adjustments. All right, here's the last thing for you, and it's a philosophical question. And I will give me a solid answer, and it's not just you. Uh, back to Otani and the theme of the gambling thing. Me, I do it all the time. It bothers me with the commissioners and the sports and all the sports that we have a gambling relationship with the fan duels and everything else because I understand it's financial, it brings lots of money in, but then we want to come across as big time anti gambling. You know, if anybody does something, they're going to be thrown out. Goodell's suspended 12 players. Do you find that hypocrisy? Does that bother you sometimes when you think about it? I know it's a big philosophical question, but give us an answer. Go ahead. You know, it really doesn't. And, and let me just make two points in support of that position. Number one, um, sports betting is going to go on in the United States, whether we have a relationship with any particular company, any gambling enterprise or not. I mean, it, the, the fact of the matter is the Supreme Court ruling opened that up and it's going to happen. And there's nothing we can do about that. Number one. Number two, I don't think it's unusual to have a set of rules that apply to fans and executives and, and you know private citizens out there on the one hand and players and people who have the ability to affect the outcome uh, of the play on the field. To have two different sets of rules um, uh, for those groups makes perfect sense to me. The fact of the matter is there, there are all sorts of situations in which you have a privilege, the priv in this case, the privilege to play in Major League Baseball, and that comes with a responsibility to refrain from engaging in certain types of behavior, in this case gambling, that are legal for other people. Baseball is healthy right now, right, but Rob? I saw the statistics, $12 billion of revenue last year. I know you always wanted to get the nine. Now you're at 12. I mean, that's part of your scorecard. Baseball is pretty healthy right now? Yeah, I, look, I do think the game's healthy. Uh, uh, you know, I've said it to the players 
Um, I, I think the game's really healthy. We're in a position where the game that we're putting on the field is really appealing for our fans. It put us, puts us in a position to grow. Like every business, there's always something going on, a challenge that you have to meet. That's the local media issue. But I think that um, we're equipped to meet it, and we're going to continue to grow this sport. All right, enjoy the games today, Rob. Enjoy the season. Uh, you know what? We appreciate here at the network you giving us so much time. Thanks very much. Appreciate it. Great to see you, Chris. We'll talk to you soon, okay?